Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Helen Soslowski, Events Director for Oblong Books. Thank you all for joining us this evening for our last author event of 2020. And what a strange year it's been for us all. How fitting it is that we're welcoming back Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist Gary Trudeau to close out our season. We last welcomed Gary at the White Hart with his collection's huge 30 years of Doonesbury on Trump in 2016 and sad, Doonesbury in the time of Trump in 2018. The latest in this series, appropriately titled The Loser, was published in July of this year. But we're here this evening to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Gary Trudeau's Doonesbury comic strip, which he created in 1970 out of characters from his popular strip, Bull Tales, that appeared in the Yale Daily News. Doonesbury's characters are as familiar to us as members of our own families and their lives have reflected every changing social and political climate over the past five decades, with a healthy dose of Trudeau's landmark satirization of each administration and its notable political figures that run throughout. To celebrate this milestone, Andrews McNeil Publishing has released an incredible limit limited edition Ultimate Doomsbury Package, Debury at 50, which I believe David has a copy of. David, could you hold it up and show us? glorious object here we go it's glorious it is it's and this a, is your flash drive with fifteen thousand strips on it search yep. <laughs> and this is the uh, user's manual yeah it's amazing it's a box digital compendium it's gorgeous it's an absolute must-have for fans of the strip and david said it contains a usb flash drive with all 50 years of doomsbury comics 26 years of sunday comics available for the first time in a digital format a 224 page wire bound user's guide, a poster and all sorts of other great stuff. So if you haven't already purchased your copy, there's a buy the book button at the bottom of your screen, that bright little green bar there. Um, it makes a great holiday gift and we have signed book plates from Gary to go with them. Thank you, Gary. Gary will be chatting this evening with David Stanford, an independent editor who, in addition to working with Gary, has worked with authors ranging from Ken Kesey, Jack Kerouac, William S. Burroughs, Alice Notley, Robert Hunter to Stuart Brand, Paige Smith, Charles Schultz, and Art Spiegelman. For the past 40 plus years, he's worked with Gary on innumerable fascinating projects, I'm curious about those, and serves as duty officer of the Doonesbury.com website where he maintains features like blowback, say what, and the mudline. For eight years, he also oversaw the Doonesbury mill blog, The Sandbox. And because you just can't keep David away from books, on Fridays, you can find him working at Oblong Books and Music in Milliton, where he's a valued and beloved member of our book selling family. <laughs> if you have questions for Gary during the course of the conversation, please enter them in the chat, not the Ask a Question module, because David will be referring to those throughout the conversation and he'll address your questions then. And without further ado, thank you both for joining us. Take it away. Great, thank you. Gary, 50th anniversary, I can't believe it. Congratulations, I admire this trip so much and it was so much fun to have this project to absorb all of our attention for four desperate months when COVID first hit last year. It was perfect. And yesterday- Well, uh, you were you, you were the hero, uh, amigo. You you actually had to read every one of those. No, uh, got to, got 16, to 16,000 strips. And, and um, y you know, it, a as we go along here, I have to tell people, you know, we've been saddle mates now for 45 years or something insane like that. And, and um, if, if anyone asks a question, and I don't know the answer, you will. You are the institutional memory of, of this feature. And um, recall all sorts of things that I don't. But, um, you know, I'm glad to be uh, here in conversation with you. Yeah. If I Likewise, likewise. And and um, let me just start to clarify one final piece of that. Um, yesterday, the key broke off in my car, you know, and I had to pull out the manual and figure out what to do about that. So I just want to say this manual is not that exact thing, but it's, it's four pages on each of the 50 years. And what it does, the thing you struggled over was Every, after the first couple of years, when you were kind of day by day and a few days at a time, you settled into a rhythm of weeks. Each week of dailies would be a storyline, maybe continued later. But that so this guide gives you every week now is described in a way that you can go. 
oh, right, when Zonker, you know, and it'll, it'll take you back. So in going through the book, you're reliving, you know, 50 years of personal life. It's sort of like listening to the radio and every song takes you a place. So this book is a, a way for fans of the strip to relive their, you know, most of their life. Yeah, that, that's, as, that's as close as, as we, could, we could get to a search engine for, for something this complicated because uh, if you were to put in a couple of key words like Mike and uh, Walden, you'd, you'd get 2,000 returns and it really wouldn't be that useful to you. So this seemed, seemed to be the, the, the best way to organize the material and, and to make it most accessible for people to retrieve strips that they that they uh, like and and the the characters are are in are in blue. The public figures are in red. There's other right. there's other uh, aids to, to 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 finding the strips that you're looking for. Oh, it's very or you tight. can just randomly go through you know a, a, a given year, like those were the years I was in college, or those are the years when my my parents first turned me on to it, or that I first got turned on to it. Mm -hmm. And 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 another interesting point that I was thinking about today. Uh, in, this, in the books that Anders McMillier Syndicate, who published this book, the same wonderful organization, the books have always had have had all of your strip, all the Doonesbury strips for some years, but that wasn't true for many years in the earlier times. And you used to approximate that the early books maybe would be 85% of what was there. So all those early years, this is everything, literally. Well, this is, this, yeah, mind. this is warts and all. In the earlier books, we left out the warts, but. but. Well, there's that perspective. <laughs> You know, when you're when you're when you're making donuts every day, you know they're not all going to be that great. Well, not and, to the cook, but to the people who eat the donuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, it, it's it's a it's such a strange um, craft because um, you know you do have to you do have to produce something every day. And um, you know, when people have have asked me in the past, uh, what do you do when you don't have any ideas? I just thank them for not noticing because there is no option but to get something out. And um, and this was pre the period when uh, my syndicate offered uh, the occasional vacation to cartoonists. So, um, you know, we were like public utilities. We were reliably churning this stuff out. So I think one of the, the great things about the last several years when um, I stepped aside from doing the, the daily strips so I could work in television. Right. And I just focused on the Sundays is I saw just how um, unfinished the earlier work was, that I have time now to circle back and to um, do for rewrites, for revisions. And, you know, a comic strip is a kind of uh, comedy haiku. and. You, you want a nice, clean through line with, um, yeah, the, you want people to pause and think about your ideas as well, but, but mostly the experience of reading the comic strip should be very efficient. And um, you don't want speed bumps. You don't want, particularly on the Sundays, these little swirls and eddies, eddies of, of verbiage that I had kind of left in my earlier Sundays because there just wasn't time to refine it. And you're trying to, you know, you're trying to, to, to clear a bar of, of, of steady excellence if you can, but that's aspirational and lots of times. Um, so anyway, this collection has, has it all. And one of the, one of the, um, the great luxuries of the last, last few years has been able to actually write more succinctly, more precisely. And I, you know, I don't know whether readers notice that or not, but I hope they do. Well, you know, you're right. And just to add a detail, it, it is a brutal routine of having to produce that much work. And in your case, you decided to make it harder because most cartoonists in the past until your time often would write six months in advance, four months, three months when, when the subject matter and the timeliness wasn't a factor. And you decided to, your strip would be delivered to your syndicate 10 days before it appeared in public. So that ramped up the stress. And I remember when we were first started working together, sometimes I would show up on Thursday. You had to turn them in on Friday evening and you'd say, I got nothing. And you'd just be sitting there starting. <laughs> it was terrifying to watch that. And then and the kid, you would have me, there was a FedEx place open, the latest one open on Manhattan. And you would have me swing by on my way back to Hoboken and send off these strips at like 11 o'clock at night. It was crazy. I, you may have gone out to the airport a few times too for ah. NFO. They were called NFO packages, next flight out. Mm. And and you could go to the baggage delivery. You know, this was pre all that security that airports right. have now. 
and 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 just get it on the plane and on time to, to to make it to Kansas City where Dodd could ink it and, and hand it and my my inking assistant. So yeah, I you know it's you have to have the temperament for it, and and I had no idea that I did have the temperament for it. it um, now, uh, when syndicates uh, review new features. Um, they're not content to say, oh, well, this, this, this person can knock out a pretty good six weeks because those six weeks might have taken six years. Right. They have to find out whether you're built for it, whether you can compartmentalize in a way to, to, to do the work and have a life. Um, and uh, it's brutal on, or it can be brutal on families because, yeah. uh, because it is so unrelenting and demanding. I found that I, I was built for it and that I actually functioned better um, with those tight deadlines, because I knew exactly where I had to be at yeah. any hour on Thursday and Friday. I was 12.30, okay, 12.30, I have to be through three and a half of these. And, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I had uh, acute situational awareness on, on Fridays, and my kids used to call it Daddy's Mad Day. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I guess I wasn't all that pleasant to be around on Daddy's Mad Day. Um, but um, uh, we all got through it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. For a good long run. Do you, do you now, a few years ago, when you were doing Alpha House, is when you took a leave from the dailies to manage that huge project. I know you said you were a showrunner. You were really involved in the whole thing, not just the writing. And you let the dailies go, maybe not knowing that you wouldn't be coming back. And, and do, you miss, do you miss that you're just doing suddenly now? Or, I mean, do you miss that ability to weigh in quickly or is it okay not so much weighing in on the on the events of the day it seems like 10 days seems like an eternity now That's for true. the for in, in in terms of news cycles um what i do miss is the storytelling and i i guess i've scratched that itch, itch in other ways now in, in in writing scripts but um uh i i really miss that in the in being unable to move the characters forward in, in real time with with story arcs that might resonate with an audience. Mostly the Sundays now are kind of they're kind of think pieces, they're kind of you know set pieces that that have a point, but but they they rarely advance advance the the characters character arcs. And I, I, I guess I do miss that part of it. Mm -hmm. Well I remember you know thinking of that first trip which was B D and Mike and then Zonker was early on, and then on the forty years later, ten years ago now, yeah, was this character map showing with dotted lines of different types all the different relationships that they had. This is like seven yeah, a relationship years. map of, of seventy five characters. It's um, that complicated. I don't, I don't know if that was useful to anybody, but it sure was but fun it, putting it together. It's impressive, and there's more <laughs> since then. When did you have it? Do characters sometime arise to you of their own volition, or was it always the, the desire to talk about a, something that was happening that brought the character to you? You think? Yeah, I, I think the latter. Um, it, 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 um, you know, first I would see if any of the, of the existing characters mm. suited the needs of the story that I, or the interests that I was pursuing. I followed. I, I wasn't just following the news. I was also following my mm. curiosity, and I found myself down down some of the damnedest rabbit holes. And sometimes that was a good thing. Uh, the story worked out. I, I, was, I was thinking of one today, um, where um, uh, Duke becomes zombified. Uh, when yeah. he's president of Baby Doc College in, in, in Haiti. And I had just finished a book by uh, um, an ethnobiologist up at Harvard uh, who had um, done a lot of research and, and had actually figured out, this is before the zombie craze, you know, what it meant to, right. to be a zombie and, and, and what it meant in voodoo culture and the voodoo religion. And he discovered that the zombie state of, of lethargy and submissiveness um, was induced by um, the ingestion of <laughs> a toxin found in the puffer fish, which um, is easily uh, found in the waters off of Haiti. Um, although probably the original recipe came from Africa, in any event, I thought this was fascinating, and it just happened to fit into, you know, seeing what's next for Duke. Right. He's in a lot of trouble now, 
and Baby Doc, who is his patron, has has fled Haiti. So why not have him him zombified by Baby Doc on the way out and and taken as as his manservant? And of course, it's it, to me it was funny to see Duke in a submissive position because right. it's so out of character. Right. Um, and so he's rescued by Zonker. But that was a case of me following something. I don't know why I find it fascinating. I just did. And and so I had to, there was a lot of exposition. I had to kind of explain all this to the readers as I was going along in a way that didn't look like I was explaining it. <laughs> and so that's a, that's a challenge, right? Um, but I think it was a successful series. Now to give you an example of where it didn't work out so, so well was when I wrote about the Loch Ness Monster and I sent Bernie over on a, on a real science expedition that the New York Times organized around the research of a guy named Doc Egerton, um, Harold Egerton, mm. who was uh, this genius professor up at MIT who, <laughs> who had uh, in, in, um, invented strobe lighting, I believe, I hope I got that right, and uh, had also come up with a new, new technology, a new sonar technology that he thought would be able to penetrate the peat field filled locks of Scotland to find the Loch Ness monster. So I thought that seems like a good use of my time. <laughs> so so I, I I called them up. I said, would you mind if I tagged along? And they said, no, you know, suit yourself. So I came along and I got absolutely fascinated by the technology, yeah. uh, Egerton's invention as, and so I made Bernie become fascinated by it. Well, I completely missed what's, important about the Loch Ness Monster, which is as a myth, you know, what the impact of mythology and, and fantasy on our lives is so important. And that could have been great. Instead, I got into the physics and into, into the into the machinery of it. And it just sucked the life out of it. So, uh, I, you know, when I look back at those trips, I don't know what what your view of them is, but but I, I, I do not think they were a success. Oh, I liked him. I thought it was it was a fun thing. I didn't know the backs. I didn't know you went there. I, I, it, yeah, it was fit right in. Road right there. That's, 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 that's the great thing. That's the great thing about the profession is you can is for the most part people are are happy to have you come along, and that's yeah. taken to me a lot to a lot of interesting places through through the yeah. years. Yeah. What is there? Is there another lesser known or not so well known backstory that strikes you? Um, maybe something I was thinking about how, you know, in the early days, st perhaps starting with Mark comes home for Christmas, his mom has her bridge club, she introduces her son. Hi, girls, my name's Mark, I smoke marijuana, cards in the air, scandal. And the strip did get uh, criticized, yeah. dropped by clients, and you're, you and the syndicate were often responding to that kind of thing. Now, the decades passed. <laughs> Less often. Well, when I look Bear. back at it, I, you, you know, you know the, when I, in my early years, um, uh, R. Crum, the great underground comic yeah. artist, um, gave an interview to the New York Times Magazine, and they asked him about a horrifying, <laughs> but hilarious, uh, take he did on incest. Oh yeah. Well, how could that be funny, right? How could that be creative in any way? I'm sorry, he couldn't defend it. I I I can't de defend it. Mm -hmm. But his answer resonated with me when, when the, he was confronted with it by the Times that he said, he said, I don't know, I guess I was just being a punk. There's something to that when you're when you're 23, which is how old I was when I wrote that. I think there was some part of me that was just say, well, let me see if I can get away with this. Uh -huh. However, it was completely in character. It, mm -hmm. it was of a piece. It, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. It, it certainly was in the spirit of the strip at the time. But it's hard for me to defend as as you know something that was appropriate for the comics page. I had a few of those yeah. <laughs> where you know I, it, the the best explanation is I was being a punk. <laughs> and the syndicate they they were very supportive of you uh, almost in every instance I would think right. Yeah, yeah. They they never they never rolled me under the bus. Uh, uh, once or twice they sent out corrections on, right. on f factual matters um, that I thought were unnecessary, but but mm -hmm. they, you know, thought thought needed to be done. Um, when I say factual matters, um, 
uh, we were talking a minute ago about exposition. There is kind of this covenant between the reader and, and the writer of, of, of comedy or, the, or a stand-up comic. Uh, in late night comedy, the setup line is usually true. They'll say, hey, did you read in the newspaper about Reagan doing this or Bush doing that or you know, Trump doing this? That's a convention that's been honored for years. Well, they don't make up that setup line. That, that setup line is actually a headline, um, usually. And so um, in the first panel of the strip, typically that's where I will put it. You know, if I'm going to uh, explain something that happened, that really happened, that's where I'll put it. And the understanding on the reader's part is, okay, that's his premise. Now he's going to riff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't riff in the first panel and then put the real facts in the last panel. Right. Um, it's, it's, that's just the convention. And, and um, so that's how, that's how, that's, you know, those are understandings between the, the, the writer and, and his audience. So generally speaking, um, the syndicate made sure I got that panel right. You know, yeah. if they were going to do any, um, if they were going to do any second guessing, or editing of, of any kind, um, that's where they would put their focus. And they say, sorry, you know, you, this, this is, they could, and, it, and, and it, they, they could even say um, I had fallen down on the job in terms of clarity, not that I had put in something that was a lie or mm -hmm. misleading. So um, I, that's when I would hear from my editor. I said, can you clean this up a bit? Yeah, or, yeah. you know, is, is, is this really true? So I, I, I started to make a, a, a habit of, you know, uh, of providing documentation if I thought it would be helpful to the, to, to my editor. I remember, I just remember you, once I asked you about this, can you talk about, you sort of, as a reader, you might assume that you write them in order, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but that's not true, right? When you were doing dailies. There's, there's really not time to write them in order. Um, you know, you can have a general story arc in, in mind, but but you've got to go with the idea you have. So I'll get an idea and I go, well, that's a, that's a, a Thursday. That's kind of deep into the story I have in mind. Or maybe it's a Friday. And so you'll, you'll slot it in. And then you have to kind of reverse engineer and say, okay, what do I need to do to get to that point uh, in, in terms of telling stories? So any given week, um, I, I don't think I've you know, it, it was very, very rare for me to write one through six in order. It was usually maybe one, four, three, five. And, and if I thought one was, was not as strong as the others and it didn't matter in terms of the progression, I would put it in on a Saturday because there's just fewer readers on a Saturday. Okay. So, so I tended to put the weaker material in on a, on a Saturday. And, and in terms of words and art, how, you know, Starts with words. Starts, starts with, with words. words. Always, always starts with words. There's very few visual gags in Doonesbury, and um, uh, I will, in my notebook, it's almost all words except for expressions. Mm. Um, expect uh, they're little. I'll work out timing in 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 tiny little sketches, um, mm. just to make sure before I commit to actually doing the drawing that it that it that it feels right. Um, but mostly my notebooks are filled with with words. Um, I, I think that's not unusual for most yeah. comic strip writers. Yeah, that would, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But one thing I, I, I like it when you build something and kind of spring it. Like, do you remember the sequence where Mike and JJ were living down on the east side and just step by step, all the characters ended up in their apartment visiting, you know, one by one, yeah. they would show up for different reasons. And then, it right. all and then they were, up. yeah, they were scattered in a drug bust, um, <laughs> <laughs> which was the wrong apartment, of course. It was, right. it, and Roland, Roland was, was following the DEA in as they were ramming down the door to Mike's apartment and all the characters are there and they all, they all scatter. Yeah, that, that was something that built up, I think, over a three month period. And um, I'm not sure initially it was the idea, but, but I've, began coming up with reasons to put the characters in the apartment, to, to crash Mike's pad. And um, uh, so, yeah, that was, that was the denouement of, of the aggregate, you know, the aggravation, <laughs> aggregation of the characters was, was um, you know, having, having the heat show up. 
And sometimes with the strips that are, are really striking, I can, I, then I suddenly think, boy, this took him five times as long to draw, like all those characters in that apartment. Every day would yeah. have been a bigger assignment. And you do that on Sundays sometimes. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing those ones that look ahead, or, you know, or guide to the characters, then it's like five Sundays and you pack it in there. Yeah, it's it's not a determinant. In in if, if I have an idea and it and it's art heavy, yeah. I just do it. Um, it's not. Um, I don't. The ones that are light on art I, I haven't been chosen for that reason. They just happen right. to be ideas that don't require it. Um, and and some of them put the burden on on George Garcilla, the, 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 the my partner who who does the color. Um, some of them are very color heavy, and. Um, uh, you know, he doesn't complain. He just, he, he you know, the, he feels he's having his moment when he gets to really strut his stuff on, on, on the ones that, that have a lot of color um, emphasis. Um, but no, it's not, it's not, it's not really, uh, doesn't it, I don't, I don't make a decision based on how much art's involved. Um, there are times when I'll look at it and say, holy cow, you know, <laughs> there's a famous uh, pogo of, of the swamp of the Oki. Pinocchi Swamp and, and the characters, the pogo is in the one corner and it's one single panel. It's not the traditional six, eight, nine panels. And, and uh, pogo is just saying, holy cow, look at all that artwork. This <laughs> 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 is a great Sunday. Yeah. In terms of intentionality, um, I think I've talked to you years ago about this, but see, like right now you must be, you're probably doing the strip, the Sunday around inauguration. And so you have this burden of, 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 of landing something in the future. And sometimes, many times, actually, as other fans will agree, a daily strip used to appear that it just seemed impossible that that strip appeared on that day because of something that happened in the news on that day or within a day or two. It just seemed like a mortar, like where you had the angle just right <laughs> and just land it. And then when I asked you about that, you 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 kind of no, nah, David. Uh, I, I'm like the, I'm the classic stop clock, you know. And I'm going to be right twice a day. It's it's if if you do something every day, yeah. Um, you know, you're going to get lucky once in a while. Well, you know, you're going to make an you're going to make an educated guess, and 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 remember, I also have to do it so it doesn't embarrass me if I get it wrong. Well, that's uh, so that so, you know so that nobody so that nobody really notices. But but yeah, sometimes sometimes it'll be spot on, and and you know I'll catch a break, and news will, news will come my way. Um, but you know it's not something you work on really. You're, you're mostly worried about um, is this going to be dated, or is is the news moving so fast yeah. that um, the reference points I'm using will will be either stale or um, obscure to people. Um, so that's a calculation I have to make each time. Uh, yeah, but was, you're right. The thinking, Sundays now, uh, you know, I I am working uh, around the inauguration that that period. I'm doing yeah. um, the 17th and the 24th of the, the two weeks that bracket. Um, and, you know, you might think, oh, he's going to get in his last licks, mm -hmm. um, you know, before before Trump leaves office. Um, but in, in a certain way, I don't think he's going he's he's not going to leave. I think. You know, this whole idea of announcing his candidacy for 2024 on Inauguration Day, I, I mean, that he's he's moved from grievance to spite and everything now is being done in spite. Uh, much, much was done despite Obama and throughout his now it's despite uh, Biden and, and he's embedding uh, these loyalists throughout the government, ma many of them unfireable, um, you know, to 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 you know, create chaos and misrule for uh, months, if not years to come. And uh, I, you know, I, there was a there was a period of time people said, oh, this is really going to be harmful to big comedy <laughs> to lose, you know, to lose um, Trump, who's been baked into the business plan for so long. But I just don't think he's going away. His family's not going away. Um, his daughter in law is thinking of running for the Senate. I, I, I just think that Trumpism will endure. And um, not that I would want to focus on that exclusively, as, as, as I pretty much have over the last four years of not just Trump, but how Trump has become subtext for so much of American life and politics and culture. Um, but uh, Biden just isn't going to be as interesting. That's, well, that's all there is to it. And, 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 and that is to be desired. We, we want a boring president. 
we, we want governments to just kind of buckle down and do what government's supposed to do and not be in constant crisis. So, but, 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 it, but what's good for America is, isn't necessarily uh, 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 great for my, for my profession. I mean, we've all had our amps turned up to 11 for so long now. Um, it's going to be odd um, to, to bring it all down. It'll be interesting to see what happens to the public conversation when it's, you know, gone from boiling to simmering um, uh, just overnight. Uh, you know, it, it may well be we'll have a split screen um, during the inauguration. There'll be, there'll be Joe, you know, with his audience uh, socially distanced, and, and there'll be this raucous rally while, you know, Trump announces his, his, his next campaign. So um, uh, I think we all want some calm um, in our lives again, um, particularly given how much... Uh, suffering and crisis there is uh, independent of who's in charge right. um but i'm not sure we'll get it it's true that the coronavirus happening at the same time is is just remarkable yeah, and I, was, I mean we lost we lost we lost more people today to to, to the virus than we lost at, at 9 11 or um you know it 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 it, 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 it many other crisis points in, in american in the American past. And it, it goes unremarked on by the president. I'm not sure he's ever called anybody to offer his condolences because he doesn't feel like it. Um, you know, it was gonna vanish and when it didn't, um, it's not his fault. It's been so. such, an, uh, such an avalanche of, of information nonstop for so long. I, I look back fondly to earlier times and, and thinking about the strip itself just to jump back to a process question for you. In, yeah. in terms of what you're reading, what you're looking at, what you're thinking about, do you just follow your personal, and then sometimes it turns out to be something for the strip? Or do you, in until recently, or even with the studies, do you set out, now I'm going to work and think about what I'm going to write about next? Is it is it not always happening in your mind? Well, they're two separate, they're two separate things. I mean, when I get up in the morning, um, uh, you know, if you're, if, if you're like me, uh, the newspapers are still a buffet. You know, it's just this, it's, it's a perfect tool in a way. You can flip through it fast, you can, you know, and I, I know I could read the Times, I, you know, I do read the Times and, and, and other newspapers online, but, but there's something about a newspaper and I say, and, and I, 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 I make my way through it. And it's such a delight. I love that part of the day. Um, there's so many um, things that, that I am still curious about. So. I will follow them, and, and a lot of them I know perfectly well, this is not going to be of any use to you, right. <laughs> except in some kind of grand abstract way, it may, it may shape, you know, some, it, it may make some connection in my brain down the road and say, wait a minute, um, you know, maybe that I, I can put those two things together and make something of it. Um, you know, that's what humor is. It's about incongruity. And, you know, the, I, I find that, that I'm most available to that uh, in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, my wife uh, describes it as, as, as being a, like a shoemaker who cuts all the little pieces of leather all day and <laughs> into the evening and then, and then goes to bed and in the morning <laughs> the shoes are made. Well, I, I leap out of bed and, and most of, it seems like most of my ideas occur to me when I'm in the shower in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the brain, you know, the different parts of the brain are talking to these, these uh, you know, to, to the other parts of the brain mm -hmm. and, and coming up with illogical, um, the kinds of illogical connections that, that make for humor. Mm -hmm. um, humor is all, the, 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 the engine of humor is surprise. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, those are the individual moments. The story itself, um, kind of um, is born out of that. Usually, usually there's a, a, a kernel of an idea, and then the story will kind of form around around that, hmm. and um, and then and then take off in unexpected directions. It's true so. that, that what you say uh, it is wonderful to be able to just go to the Atlantic and Rolling Stone and newspapers in any city you think of at any yeah. time, and yet when you have a physical object, be it a magazine or a newspaper, you're going to pick up stuff or a you, book. Never would found, or you never would have found your, your way to online, <laughs> yeah. especially the books. Uh, yeah. And and I yeah. like that you in the strip always, over the years, I think you've you've often referred to newspapers. You, you've had them in more, in the last 10 years, I would say, you made sure you 
keep mentioning newspapers, have the older right. characters explain them to the younger characters. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, I mean, obviously um, their heyday is over and we're moving on to different platforms. And, uh, you know, in, in general, I think the, the democratization of, of media that's allowed more voices to contribute to the public conversation is a, is a good thing. Mm. Um, uh, there are more voices that were unheard in the past that are being heard now as a result. Um, I, I like all of that, the, the let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Mm. Um, but um, I guess one thing I miss, my old fogey um, nostalgia, is for a more a broad, common public conversation that when I, w when I was a, a, a student in, in college, I could walk into the, the, the dining hall of my college and see uh, my residential college and see um, a sea of, of fluttering paper. The, everybody was reading the student newspaper. So there was, we were talking about things in common. Um, and that doesn't exist anymore. In the early days, I used to be able to riff on a single author like mm -hmm. David Halberstam or Gay Talese or um, Tom Wolfe or uh, even someone as obscure as, as uh, Yevtushenko, the Russian poet. And because he'd been on the cover of Time, um, uh, everybody was kind of aware of him. He'd you know, given a, a reading in Madison Square Garden. And so I could, I could write about figures in popular culture and even in, in um, literature. And most readers would, would have a vague awareness of who they were, the, the, the mailers and the updikes and, you know, these, these lions of, of, of literature um, that uh, I could make certain assumptions about, about what my readership would get. And uh, I, can't, I can't do that anymore. I can't do it in music. I can't do it in art. I can't do it in literature um, because there are, uh, there are too many categories uh, it's the, the, the fields are way too broad to make any assumptions. I mean, you could name every day I, I will pick up uh, a paper or, or go online and learn of a new artist or recording artist or um, conceptual artist who is hugely popular within their world. They have millions of followers, et cetera, that I've never heard of. And um, I think that's true for all of us. Uh, you can't cover it all. Um, the, so I, I, I guess I do kind of miss that. I feel like when I, when I have a conversation with someone, you kind of have to feel them out. Um, even talking about television, right? Mm -hmm. You, can, you oh, can't, yeah. you, you know, you used to be able to assume that when I, when I went to school as a kid, everybody had watched the same program that the night before, or there was a really good chance they had. Um, now there, there are hundreds and hundreds of channels. So you can't, you can't assume that. Um, even even a, a show, iconic shows like um, The Sopranos, they never got an audience of more um, more than uh, 10 million or so at, at, at their height. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, when I uh, now now a show is a, is a big hit if it if it hits a half a million or a million. The Daily Show never had more than two million. We think huh. everybody watched The Daily Show. Well, it's a country of 330 million people, mm -hmm. and only two men on any given night were watching that show. Right. So. Uh, you know, you may be able to talk to your hipster friends and, and make a certain assumption that they had watched the show the night before, but, but it's not something we share anymore. Yeah. Um, I did an animated uh, special for NBC back in the 70s, and uh, I was hoping in, in my delusional, grandiose um, aspirations for the show, uh, oh, maybe it'll be an evergreen, you know, like the Peanuts shows. And oh, yeah. uh, you know, I get to do a new one every year and, and it'll be on, on forever. So I did it and it got, it got very nice some critical attention. And uh, so I, I called up, uh, you know, the executive in NBC and said, uh, uh, we're doing this again, right? And he, said, <laughs> and he said, no, I'm afraid not. There's been a lot of talk here and, and we like the, the, the response it got, but uh, the audience just wasn't big enough. And I said, oh, he said, yeah, that was disappointing numbers. Only 21 million people saw it. <laughs> so, I went, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, really? I only, I only, brought, to, I only brought 21 <laughs> million people to NBC that, last night. Um, but, you know, there, there were only a, 
what four or five channels at this right. time. So, so, so that was a disappointment. So you know, where so media is balkanized, popular culture is balkanized. It's it's something that um, I've gone on much too long about this, but. But, um, you know, that makes it that makes it more difficult to do some of the things I did uh, earlier. Um, I, I can't make those same same assumptions um, about things that are suitable for a, for a wide audience. It's interesting when you say that it's like the evolution of like you say, the networks and UHF for the core. But then things like Alex Haley's roots in 75 or six, whenever that was right, suddenly 50 people in the campus around the TV. It, it was a national experience and the mini series became so big that now there's so many that there are too many of those to watch yeah you know yeah i've been ignoring yeah. viewer questions and i apologize over here all right well, one from, well, why don't you pick one, one out um, there well, who's that from i just go oh, rocco Steino wants to know about uh, today's james thurber's birthday are you a james thurber fan do you have any thoughts about him did he have any role um, in your revolution? I, 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 I don't. Um, I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've been remiss because he's so admired by so many people. And I've been sent books. And I, you know, I, I, I'd like to say that, that uh, one of my great contributions to comic strips is that I, is that I made the, the medium uh, safe for, for mediocre art. And even I look at Thurber's cartoons and say, kind of wish they were drawn a little better. And I, so I never really, you know, the dogs are okay, but I never really got into it. So I, you know, I apologize if that's a disappointment to, 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 to our audience member, but, but um, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I, I can't, I, I can't fake it. I can't pretend that, I that Thur Thurber's on my list of greats. Also question from Ann Sartori. Um, when you do a Sunday, how many hours does that represent? I mean, how many, I, I won't try and parse the question for you. Just how, what do you say about that? What's your? Wow, that's, that's, it's really hard to say. It represents more hours now because um, the work has expanded to fill the time, right? So I have more time to do it, so I take more time in the doing. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's not five days a week. Um, it, the, the writing is generally, uh, uh, I would say, altogether maybe a day and day and a half or two days. Whereas before, it it it, it really couldn't be more than that. I mean, it, it had to be like a half a day uh, because there just wasn't time. Um, but now I do them in a more leisure, leisurely pace. Um, so it leaves it leaves uh, time for other creative endeavors and for uh, for grandchildren. At least it did until until earlier this year. Well, you couldn't get no. to them as easily. <laughs> no, no, no. We well, had a no. we had a we had a Zoom Thanksgiving, like like many people. Right. Well, you know, as as you mentioned, you've always or often been able to do side projects, going way back to the Broadway show, and you've written screenplays, and you've had a couple of things go well into production, and then Alpha asked you, "Are you working on something else now?" And if so, is that something that you can say anything about, or is it better not to mention? David, could you vamp for like um, I would love 10 to seconds? So I'm about to lose power. All right. Oh, so this is there you go. Yeah, because otherwise I'm going to you're just going to lose me entirely. OK, well, that wouldn't be so good. My fans out there, uh, if you haven't seen that Doonesbury special he was talking about 1975 or something, it's worth tracking that down on somewhere. But if that really holds up. It's kind of summarizes that whole first first eight or nine years this the feeling of that you're crackling very good there's power yeah so now i'm on the floor but um nice. all right can you see me yeah yeah good that's good lighting actually nice. <laughs> all right <laughs> i'll try to keep the screen still all right where were we uh, other projects. Are you working on anything now, or do you have something in the works that you can talk about? Um, I I am uh, several things, but um, the uh, they're not real until they are. If, right. if if I can dodge the question. No, that's, that's um, You know, they're they're in, in, until until somebody says they're a project, they're not. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's just the way it is. And, and uh, I've, so I've got several in the works. And when one of them actually happens, uh, I'd be happy to share. 
do you have do you hear from younger cartoonists do you follow online comics what do you have a sense of the state of the art form in in the more inclusive way aside from the newspaper part of it no i i i have to i have to admit that um when I'm asked by by aspiring cartoonists, uh, you know, a, a way into the business or advice as to how to how to get involved, I usually kind of say, "Go west, young man." I mean, go to Pixar. Go to um, if if you're if you if, you know if 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 you want to express yourself through cartooning, either do graphic novels or animation, because I don't think there's a a, a long future for newspaper cartooning, and um, certainly. Um, uh, online is is one way to go, but but um, the audiences are relatively small, and most most uh, folks who who go that route can't really make a living. I think I think that's true actually of newspaper cartoonists for for many of them now too. Is that is you know we've lost hundreds and hundreds of newspapers since uh, since two thousand in this country, and a lot of alternative newspapers. There were some people that could put together a living. Um, on, with weeklies, right. um, but 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 that's no longer possible. So so I, I you know I try to be realistic in the in the advice I give. It's it's um, you know it's sad. It's a profession that has been very very good to me, um, but but the indus the industry I, I don't think can support it, and and edit, it's even worse for editorial cartooning. Yeah. Um, and and I I, I I guess I especially miss that. Um, uh, you know I I. I know and knew a lot of those guys and um I, I i i think there were maybe 200 editorial cartoonists who actually drew a salary at newspapers when i began i think it's probably down more like 25 or 30 now it's just yeah. a handful yeah you're right and and the parallel tragedy in my view is the gradual disappearance of independent or separate book review sections in the new york times or yeah Rome, it's you know, San Francisco Chronicle, Chicago, one by one, people gave up that space. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, so here we are for our blog post. Let me ask you, what, 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 do you read more fiction, nonfiction, a wide mix? What, and what, and what have you read lately that, that you like? Well, I'm, <laughs> for one of the projects I'm working on, I'm reading a book, a fascinating book called First Light um, by, um, Gosh, what's his name? Uh, Wellam, Jeffrey Wellam. He's a, a, um, a, a former uh, uh, RAF Spitfire fighter pilot from World War II, and he wrote his memoirs in 2006 from his diaries. So they're incredibly detailed. And um, he just makes those dogfights in the sky come alive in a way that, um, you know, is, is hard to do on the page. And um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot out of that in terms of, of you know, my research interests. But, but quite beyond that, um, I, you can't read more than a paragraph without thinking, boy, is this not me? Boy, would I not be able to do this? <laughs> and yet he feels so blessed. He feels so lucky to be up in the air, you know, with, with, with German warplanes buzzing around him trying to kill him. And, <laughs> And somehow he's just he's just built for it and and knows it and has a kind of quiet confidence and and anyway so it's it's been a delight reading his his memoirs. That's my most recent. Uh, no, that sounds great. No, that sounds really good. Do you do you do you read fiction and nonfiction both? I th I have the feeling you do. I think we talked. Yeah, I do. I tend to read I tend to read fiction um, uh, on vacation and 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 now I'm. I'm actually trying to decide what to take because we're we're about to leave on a on a one week vacation and um, you know we have I've got un unfortunately I think like most people I I have a, an awful lot of books I meant to read and um, so uh, you know I don't have to go out and buy one I'm, <laughs> there's plenty around that I'll have to select you know when last minute when I do um, I, I I I have a um, a new book uh, called Nixon Land uh, which is nonfiction. Uh, about um, uh, when uh, Nixon was president and in the years that followed. And basically it's a history of, 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 of modern conservatism. It's one in a trilogy, or you know, I think there may even be a fourth book. So I, I might take that. I have another one called Founding Brothers about um, what it sounds like, um, 
uh, Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and that gang. Um, oh, yeah. You can never read enough about them, right? <laughs> now we're, we're getting close. I have a couple more questions I want to get to. I have, I've got one asking, uh, maybe, maybe by default you answered it, asking if you'd ever thought about or been attracted to the idea of working on a graphic novel or some long form piece like that. No, I'm not sure I have the patience for it. And, and also I don't know as I have the story for it. I'm really a short order kind of guy, you know. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm better at the short form. When I, do, when I write television, um, yes, there are, there are story arcs and they're often there are multiple ones. And, and Alpha House, um, as with Tanner, um, usually involve multiple storylines uh, within a half hour format. And I love braiding them together and using maybe more coincidence than I should to have them, you know, intersect. Um, but um, um, mostly what I love is writing the scenes, which is pretty much what I've been doing, you know, for years, for my whole right. career. Yeah. And, um, I, I, and I love drilling down into character and to, um, uh, figuring out what the conversation would be between these two, two, three, four characters, however many it is. Um, I was very influenced, as you know, by, by Robert Altman, who I eventually got to work with. Um, but when I saw MASH as, as, as a kid in college, a sneak preview, I was just blown away. All the characters were talking at the same time. They were talking the way we really talk, which is mostly we get the gist of what somebody is saying, but then we're preparing our answer before we've heard them out completely. Conversation is interrupted, they overlap. They, so, so Altman understood that and he put it up on the screen and I went, you can't do that. It's a movie. You're supposed to have this clean back and forth uh, dialogue, you know, where we get to hear one person, then we get to hear the next. And he was, he was, uh, you know, it's like he was a, a record producer uh, moving the dials up and down. And, and, and he'd bring in one character and he'd put, put him in the background and bring in another character. And, and I thought, wow, that's, that's a great way to describe conversation to, mm -hmm. because that's how we experience it. And not only that, but it allowed him to bring out beautiful comedic mo moments that were grounded in, in the personality of the person speaking. Um, I don't write jokes, and Altman never told jokes either. Uh, it's all character humor. It's all people just being themselves. It's all behaving. And, um, you know, that was his genius, and I, I tried to learn from that. Um, probably was more influenced by him than, than, than actual cartoonists at, at that early stage. Pfeiffer was very important. We've talked about that a lot. Uh, Jules Pfeiffer, who I first discovered as a dramatist. Um, you know, I heard, I saw his, his, yeah. some of his, some of his work dramatized in, in high school and, uh, and thought he was a playwright. Well, he is, but, mm -hmm. but, um, I didn't understand that foremost, he was, he was a cartoonist. So I circled back and discovered that work and it was very important to the, uh, to the aesthetic of the strip is, is, is obvious. I think to anyone who looks at that early work. Yeah. Well, someone is asking about in terms of your artwork. Uh, whether you work in in other mediums, digitally, ink, and I know I know from just alert other people listening that you and George have uh, have done what eighty a hundred I mean endless posters, wonderful creative things for organizations yeah. or events. Those are out there and worth hunting down on the internet. But but the question to you is is about art and what you do, and and you do plenty in the strip. It's not like you need to do more, but. Ye Right. Well, uh, my background was um, uh, my my original training was was in graphic design. I have a master's in, in, in graphic design. And I, I, I when I began the strip, I was also I also had a graphic studio in New Haven, uh, Connecticut, and was doing both at the same time, which is two full time careers that couldn't last and didn't. Uh, I had to, I had to choose one. But because of that background, I've, I've, I, I try to take as many opportunities as as I have. Um, uh, time for uh, to, to to do posters and book covers and illustrations for magazines. I don't do it that much, but when I do, it, it allows me to play art director, um, and um, I, I I I really enjoy it. And I think it's been I think think it's been helpful um, in in just problem solving on on uh, in in my aesthetic work. 
um, to have had that training. And, um, uh, you know, I think I think the package that, that you held up earlier. Um, you were just sending me back to it by what you said, because yeah, this yeah. was an evolution, right, to get to this place. It was it was an evolution. If you if you turn it around. Yeah. You see, see, the, see the back. Um, you have to be a real um, nerd to 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 see it. But this was a, a take my take on the Beatles White Album. And the original box was white. And I, I was very, I've been very taken with the quality of the packaging of Apple products. So I wanted to do a, a white box with white type on it. Well, you have to be the Beatles and the whole world waiting for your next album to drop for that to work. And so when George sent it back to me, um, uh, I said, OK, it, it looks beautiful, but no one's going to see it in a store. And it makes, makes no sense. So, so let's drop out just the type and we'll make it a black package. Now those four little drawings on the back, um, right, the four little drawings on the back uh, uh, mimic the four portraits of the Beatles on the back of the White Album, which were taken by Richard Avedon. And the Beatles are deeply in shadow. So to, to, to show George, the designer, what I had in mind, I did the, these four little pencil sketches and sent them off to him. And I said, we should model these. We'll ink them and color them and model them. And then this other idea occurred to me, which was to, to, instead of doing that, to leave the original pencil sketches, which I think conveys a kind of urgency, the, the kind of act of, of, of drawing in a way that, that finished ink drawings don't. And then we'll lay, layer on top of it tints and, and see if that doesn't um, look a little different and, and make the characters come alive in a different way. So, and then that led to the poster and uh, other uses of the characters. Um, yeah, they're all they're all uh, uh, pencil sketches. So, um, and and so there's a uniformity to the drawing, um, which is which is nice. And um, and then inside with the the user manual, uh, I did a full a full page sketch oh, right, right. Uh, of 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 Zonker and Mike and JJ in in the early '80s when they. They lived on the east in the East Village, and um, we, the, when you close the cover, that it, there's a little hole through which we see Zonker. Anyway, uh -huh. uh, that's way more than you need to know. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, yeah, I know how much time you guys spend and how much you enjoy that aspect. Yeah, of doing yeah. Great projects. Well, great, Gary. I think we're getting close to the end here. Looks like we're just about arriving in the harbor at the right moment. Okay. Right, talk well, it's you. it's. Delight talking to you, amigo, and um, uh, let's do it again soon. Pleasure. Let's do it anytime. And thanks for helping Oblong. Love Oblong. Yes, yes. thank you both very, very much. That was great. That was a great discussion and lovely to hear all of you know your, the history that you guys have. It was very, very entertaining, and we thank you very much. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who joined us this evening. Thank you all for your continued support of Oblong. It really has helped our little independent bookstore weather this storm. Um, and by attending these events, you're not only helping the bookstore, but you're also supporting authors who have books coming out during this really difficult year and this difficult time. Um, so I'd like to thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. We really appreciate it. Have a safe and healthy holiday. And don't forget to order your copy of Beavery at 50. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> okay. Thanks, David. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Good night. Good night.